Uh, but anyway, one last thing to say uh, related to the derivative is, I, I mentioned last time, what I wanted to talk about is um, another classic theorem from calculus about relative extrema. I don't know what, what words you use in your calculus class to talk about these things, but uh, a relative extremum is either a relative minimum or a relative maximum of a function. Uh, and the fact about the derivative is that those things occur either on interval endpoints or when the derivative is zero. Uh, so that's what I want to talk about. Um, I don't really want to deal with interval endpoints, so I'm just going to talk about a function whose domain is uh, an open interval. Say here's a function with domain, an open interval from A to B. And it is a fact that any um, relative maximum or relative minimum occurs at a point where the derivative is zero. On this picture that I drew, there is a relative maximum right there. And this occurs at some point when the derivative is zero, right? This is a major theme in a typical calculus class. Um, and actually, one of the original reasons why calculus was created as a method to find minimum and maximum points of functions, which is super useful in physics. You know, if you uh, shoot a cannon, how high is it going to go before it starts to come back down? Which also will let you calculate where it will come back down. Um, anyway, here's the, uh, the, the theorem that I want to talk about to get it started. Um, if f is differentiable, on some open interval, the open interval A to B. I'm talking about open intervals here just so that we don't have to talk about the end points as special cases. I don't, I don't want to get into that. Um, so let's just talk about uh, F on the open interval. If F is differentiable on A to B and there's some, let's just talk about maximum, although what I say is also true of minimum values, but like in the picture, let's just talk about a value which is a maximum in there. So I'm gonna say, and f of c is a maximum value of f on that interval. So f of c, there's some point c on, on my picture, it's there. There's some point c where the, the function actually has a maximum value. So if f is differentiable and f of c is the maximum value on the interval a to b, then the derivative is zero. f prime of c equals zero. That's what we want to show. All right. All right, let's see if we can do this. Actually, the proof of this is kind of uh, kind of cute, kind of nice. It's not, uh, it's not all that hard to understand, I don't think. Um, so uh, we assume all of that about the function. I want to prove that f prime of c equals zero, so I might as well start with the, you know, the definition of what f prime is, right? f prime of c is, I hope you remember, lim x goes to c, f of x minus f of c over x minus c, right? And I want to show that this is 0. So we'll show this is 0, right? And um, actually, we this usually you would not do, but we can do this using sequences. We're trying to show that this limit is going to be 0. Um, in this example, it, this will work out to use sequences. Usually you use sequences to show that some limit does not exist or does not equal something. But uh, it's going to turn out all right to use sequences. So let's use sequences. Uh, what we're going to do is choose one sequence which approaches C um, but uh, sort of from below and another sequence which approaches C from above. Like C here on the picture is just some point in between A and B. So we can choose a sequence which approaches C but from values that are less. And then we can choose another sequence which approaches C but from values that are more. So I'm going to say 
uh, take, I'll call it like xn approaching c with xn less than or equal to c for all n, and another yn approaching c with yn uh, greater or equal to c for all n, all right? And this is possible, actually this is the step at which we use the fact that it's an open interval because c is not on the end. You can actually choose points that approach from below and also points that approach from above um, because c is not an end point of the interval because the interval, it's an open interval so it doesn't have any points. So c is not on the end, so we can choose some points which approach c from below and some other points which approach c from above. So we can write it this way if you like. And we're going to use something like a squeeze theorem here, right? The xn's are less than the c's and are less than the yn's. All right, uh, because f is continuous, we can just plug all these values into the function. So since f is continuous, Um, I can plug in f of x n uh, approaches f of c, right? And f of y n approaches f of c also. But in terms of the inequalities, um, what's uh, interesting here is that the inequalities don't look like this anymore when you plug them into f because c is a maximum value. So f of xn approaches f of c, f of yn approaches f of c, and as far as the inequalities goes, f of xn is less than or equal to f of c, and f of yn is also less than or equal to f of c. That's because c, uh, f of c is the maximum. So there, uh, both of those things are less than f of c. f of c is the maximum value of the function, so it must be more than uh, f of any of the other points in the function. All right. Uh, so what does this mean about the derivative? This is all the setup here. Uh, now it's a matter of plugging things into the derivative formula, which we see up at the top there. So um, when I look at the xn's, f of xn, this is f of f prime of c, right? Because uh, f of f prime of c its definition usually is just with like any x, but sorry, I don't mean xn approaches c. I just mean lim as, as sequences, right? f of xn is a sequence, and you can take the limit of this whole thing. Because the limit of the, uh, because the derivative exists, it must equal the limit uh, along any specific sequence that approaches c, and so it's this. <coughs> but anyway, can we say, um, what do you say about the signs in this fraction? The signs of each of those. Looking at what we've got so far here. Can anybody say what's the bottom? Is the bottom positive or negative? Negative, he says. Yeah, it's, be it's negative because of this, right? Xn's are less than C. And so I have a, uh, you know, a, a smaller minus a bigger. That will be negative. And what about the numerator? Also negative, because we also said this, this right here, f of xn is less than or equal to f of c. So this one is also negative. So what we have here is f prime of c is the, the limit of, actually this fraction is always positive, right? The whole fraction overall is always positive. And so this being the limit of something which is always positive, it means f prime of c is positive, right? By the rules about limits, the limits of something which is always positive has to be always positive or perhaps equal to zero. All right. 
That was with the x's. Let's do the same thing with the y's, right? xn and yn are both two sequences that approach c. So I can say also f prime of c is the limb using the y's. f of yn minus f of c over yn minus c. And what about these signs? Um, on top, f of yn minus f of c, I think that is also negative for this, this reason here. The f of yn is less than the f of c. And so when I subtract on the top there, that's negative. <coughs> Neg. What about the bottom, yn minus c? It'll be positive, It'll be positive. yeah, because we said up here, the yn's are bigger than the c. So yn minus c is positive. And so this whole fraction is always negative, which means when we take the limit of that fraction, f prime of c must be less than or equal to zero. All right? Put it together, what do you get? These, these things together. What does that mean? It is equal to zero. Right, f prime of c must equal zero. <coughs> and this is what, that was our job, right? To show f prime of c equals zero. All right. How do you like that? You know, on the picture, I would say your sort of how you see this play out on the picture is basically if I am approaching this point C, but only looking at the slopes, coming from this direction, the slopes will always be positive because I'm going up towards the, the maximum. Coming from this direction, the slopes will always be negative. I'm still going up towards the maximum, but that, that's when I'm moving backwards, right? So actually, uh, to the right of this point C, you're going down from the maximum. So those slopes will be negative. If these slopes are always positive and these slopes are always negative, the only way it can make any sense in the middle is if it's zero, right? That's my, that's my uh, informal version. This is, this, is what the, this is how you actually say that in the proof. You say, on the one hand, the thing is always going to be positive when we approach uh, from below, but it's always going to be negative when we approach from above. So when you get there, it has to be zero in the middle. All right. Any thoughts about that one? This is, well, I don't know if this theorem has a name, but this is the theorem that all calculus students know about uh, the derivative is zero at a relative extreme point, either a minimum or a maximum. We did it for maximum. You can do the whole, the whole proof the same way for a minimum. All right. Any thoughts about that one? All right. Um, I got one more sort of big, uh, big hit, greatest hits from calculus is kind of what we've been doing the past couple of days. Um, one last one, uh, the, the final of your favorite uh, value theorems is the mean value theorem. We talked already about the intermediate value theorem there's something called the extreme value theorem, which is just says that a function on a closed interval has a, mi a maximum overall and a minimum overall. And the mean value theorem is maybe the most uh, sophisticated of them, or most, most complicated to talk about, and it's the one which actually involves the derivative. Um, the picture for the mean value theorem is something like, if I have a function, um, like this say, on a closed interval, so I'm only considering my function from A to B, something like that. Anybody remember what this theorem is about? The mean value theorem? Um, it has to do with the slope of this function. The average slope from, from one end of the interval to the other, the slope uh, just from one end of the interval to the other would be the slope of this line, right? That, is, that, sl that slope is sometimes called the average slope uh, over the interval or the mean. That's, what, that's where the word mean uh, comes in in this. The mean value theorem says that that overall average slope is actually the same as one of the slope points of the function. So it says that somewhere inside here is actually a point where the derivative equals that slope. And on my picture, actually, I can see two such points, but one maybe around there. I chose that point as one where the derivative at that point 
the slope at that point is the same as the slope of the of the average slope across the interval. All right, that's the mean value theorem. So there is, uh, I will say, some interior point has slope equaling the average slope or the mean, if you like. That's the mean value theorem. This is the, um, I've heard of the mean value theorem being used. I believe they do this in the UK, I think. Um, they don't do it in the United States as far as I know. Where, um, one thing that I knew a guy once who refused to get an easy pass, because he said, I'm not getting that. That's how, you, that's how they track you. Um, this was a while ago that I talked to this guy. There are now many, many more ways that they track you. But um, he didn't want the easy pass because that's how they track you. And people are, um, I, I, I can't, uh, occasionally I hear sort of like uh, privacy paranoid people talking about how, you know, someday they're just going to like hand out speeding <laughs> tickets based on easy pass data. Um, because, for instance, if you, if, you, if you pass two easy pass checkpoints, they can tell how fast you are going. Um, <laughs> from one to the other and then they could just like automatically send you a ticket couldn't they I don't believe they have they actually do that in the United States although I, I believe this does happen in the UK but actually that whole scheme that whole strategy relies on the intermediate or the uh, the mean value theorem not the intermediate value theorem uh, because the idea is if I say uh, drive for say 10 miles in between two easy pass checkpoints and they can measure uh, the amount of time it took me what they can determine is my average speed over that duration. And if they say my average speed was like 70 miles per hour, then you get a ticket. They do that, they do that. I think that this is actually done. But the, the, uh, uh, it's an objection that I could have as a person is, you know, I know my rights as a Merkin. Um, if you want to give me a ticket because I broke the law, you have to observe me breaking the law, right? Um, just because, I could say, just because my average speed was 70, that doesn't mean I actually went above 70, does it? And the answer is yes, it does, because of the mean value theorem. This is why it means if your average speed was 70, you must have actually exceeded 70 at some particular moment, right? Um, I believe in the American justice system, it is permissible for the police to somehow logically prove that you committed a crime rather than actually observing you committing the crime, right? Isn't that what like detectives do? I mean, I, I don't know. I, th I think, I don't think it's true that they have, to, they have to actually see you. If they can somehow like mathematically prove that you were speeding anyway, that to me seems <laughs> good enough, but um, I'm not suggesting that they do this. Anyway, that, so this is my example that I think on some level basically everybody believes the mean value theorem even if even if people are not able to articulate exactly what it what it's about but that's what it's about if the if there is some kind of average speed then actually that means that there was a particular point at which the speed at that moment was equal to the average speed over the interval all right um, I would like to the, the proof of the mean value theorem is a is kind of a kind of messy and uninspiring, although I would like to talk about sort of a simple version of the mean value theorem. This is kind of like a, a baby mean value theorem. Once you prove this one, then the, the, the whole big boy mean value theorem is not much more interesting or difficult than this. So I, I would like to focus on this MVT mean value theorem. This is called Rolle's theorem. And it is the same idea, but if you just kind of flatten out this picture, what it looks like is, so I'm gonna write this as a theorem. It says, I'll write it in words and then I'll draw the picture. If F is differentiable on some closed interval A to B, and F of A equals F of B, 
So this is this was missing from the the real mean value theorem. This is an extra assumption in Rolle's theorem. Uh, so what that means is I have a closed interval a to b is the domain, and then my function just kind of does something, but f of a equals f of b. So the y value here and here must be the same y value, but then it can do whatever stuff in between. Whatever you like. It has to be continuous and differentiable. Actually, that looks like I drew a little pointy point in there. That's not differentiable, but don't, don't draw that like I did. I did it again. How about that? All right. Um, then, can anybody say what, what this means? Like in terms of the mean value theorem, what if you do the mean value theorem on this picture? Uh, actually, it becomes a, 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 an easier thing to say. I will say then there exists some point C in the open interval A to B. There's some point in between such that, can anybody say what, what can you conclude here? Yeah? Yes, uh, almost. Surely you meant uh, the derivative is zero at some point in between. So on my picture, I can see two such points, but you know one is there, right? Such that f prime of c equals zero. This is called Rolle's theorem. Yeah, this is this is uh, this is why I describe this as the baby mean value theorem. Um, the mean value theorem and this are basically the same, although this one is kind of flattened out. The mean value theorem is more general because it allows it to be tilted somehow. Um, the, the, so this one says basically if, if those guys are at the same point horizontally, then there's some other point where the derivative is zero. Whereas this one is about any, any kind of arrangement tilted. They're the same basic idea, it's just one is one is flat and the other is tilted. And if you want to prove, so I want to talk about the proof of Rolle's theorem. If you want the proof of the mean value theorem, you, you basically take everything that we're about to say and apply a linear transformation that tilts the whole picture. And, it, and the whole proof still works. It's just everything is slightly more complicated. And I don't want to get into the details of that. All right. Uh, but anyway, Rolle's theorem. This is, uh, we're going to sort of use uh, a whole bunch of facts uh, that we have already talked about about um, continuous functions and so on. So uh, here is um, why Rolle's theorem is true. Um, so uh, first of all, the closed interval is the domain here. This is, uh, it's a, um, well, it's a compact set. It's a nice little review. So that means there is a minimum and a maximum value of f of x on the closed interval a to b, right? Actually, this, this almost does it completely. Anybody see it? What does that have to do with, um, with what we're trying to find at some point where the derivative is 0? Yeah. Is it that where that c is when I didn't do any lines with Yeah, actually, what we said before, so this, this theorem was this one that we started off with. If you have a maximum value, then the derivative is zero there. So that's, that's kind of it, right? This function, because this is compact, there's a maximum and a minimum. That's the extreme value theorem, which we, we talked about several months ago. Uh, anyway, that means, because of the theorem that we said before, um, whatever the maximum is, its derivative is zero there. And whatever the minimum is, its derivative is zero. Except there is a, an unfortunate uh, caveat here that only works when C is on the interior when C is not one of the endpoints so this we need to worry about very slightly so the interval is compact so there's a minimum and a maximum value and I'm gonna say if some interior point C <coughs> is a minimum or maximum then C is in the open interval A to B and we use you know, that other theorem from, that we started off uh, at the beginning of class with. 
which doesn't really have a name. I'll just say we use the other theorem to say that f prime of c equals zero as desired, all right? Now there is a, uh, like I said, a, a caveat. You have to discuss in a special case, what if the minimum and the maximum values are actually A and B? Uh, that's a special situation in which this, this reason that I just said does not apply in that special case where, so I will say in the special case where f of a and f of b are um, minimum and maximum values, what can you say about that? I'd have to think about like what, what could the picture possibly look like in that case? My picture, remember, has, first of all, it is a basic assumption at, before anything that f of a equals f of b. Now, what if I also tell you that a and the b, they are the minimum and the maximum values of the function? What? Yeah, it means the function must be a constant, right? It, it can't do anything else. It can never go above uh, the a or below the b. So it has to be a constant. So then f must be a constant. Constant function. So it, in this very particular case, it has to look like that. And then what can you say? I mean, we're trying to conclude this, that there's some point where the derivative is zero. What if it's a constant function? then the derivative is zero, like actually always zero, not just at a specific point, but because uh, everybody knows. So f must be a constant function, so f prime of c equals zero actually for all c in the open interval. That's, that's more than we needed to prove the theorem. The, the theorem just says there exists one uh, specific point. In the case when it's a constant function, uh, they all have derivative zero. All right. This is Rolle's theorem. It really follows directly from what we what we talked about at the beginning, although with this weird special case. Yeah. Why do you want to say? Um, you want to say open intervals rather than closed intervals because you don't want A or B. Yeah, it's really because this theorem that we're using uh, is about open intervals. Okay. So if you're going to use this theorem, which we we did. Um, need to talk specifically about the, uh, the interior points. Yep. Okay. All right, that's Rolle's theorem. Like I said, the, so the proof of the actual mean value theorem is the same idea, only you have to straighten out the picture. It's, I don't want to get into the details of that. It's simple. Uh, you could look it up in the book if you like. All right. Okay, I got... We have 20 minutes remaining, plenty of time. I got two cute, sort of obvious seeming uh, theorems from calculus that probably you never talked about in calculus, although I think that these are very interesting. Um, I don't know if you will agree with me, but um, they are nice, cute corollaries Both of these are things that any calculus student will tell you are obvious, although I would encourage you to think, is how obvious is, is that really obvious? Um, here is the first one. Corollary number one. Um, both of these are proved using Rolle's theorem, that's why, I'm, or using the intermediate value theorem. Uh, the first one says, if f prime of x equals zero for all x, then, this says if the derivative of a function is always zero, then, I'm gonna say the, the conclusion, I said these, these theorems will be obvious to any calculus student. What do you say? Then it's a constant, I hear the whispers. Yeah, then f is a constant function. I will say it this way, f of x equals c. 
um, for all x. Is that, this is something that um, students in calculus believe this, although it's not actually something that is usually discussed in a calculus class. So in a calculus class, it's very easy to show, just using the definition of the derivative, that any constant function has derivative zero. But the other way around is something that people don't usually talk about. This is, um, if the derivative is zero, then your function must be a constant. Actually, that is less obvious. Maybe there's some kind of wild function whose derivative ends up being zero all the time, even though the function itself is not a constant. Um, it's not true, but this is, this is something uh, interesting to, to think about. Uh, it says there are no other functions whose derivatives are zero except for constants. Constants are the only functions like that. All right. Uh, anyway, you can demonstrate this using the mean value theorem. So I'm going to say, let's, I want to prove this using the mean value theorem. So I'm, let's, uh, let's do this by contradiction. So I'm going to say, let f prime of x be zero for all x. And then I'm going to assume in order to get a contradiction that f is not a constant function. Uh, what that means is, uh, what does it mean to not be a constant function? It means at some point you have two points where the, the values of the function are different. So I'm going to say, assume that, say, f of a is not equal to f of b for some two different numbers. All right, that's what it means to not be a constant, is that there are two points where the two values are different. All right, uh, what, what does this mean in terms of the mean value theorem? So I will draw a little picture here. Not a very interesting picture. We don't know anything about this f, but we do know that f of a is different from f of b. Can anybody say what the mean value theorem means in that case? The mean value theorem is about there is some point inside between A and B where something, something, something. Yeah? It's like there's a point where the slope is like Is that. Yeah, right. So whatever this is here, uh, there is some point, I'll call it C, there exists some point between A and B. with f prime of c equals that slope. Could I just say, I mean, I don't really know what that slope is. It, I, well, you can say specifically what it is. It's f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. That's the rise over the run. But anyway, what I care about is not zero, right? That slope I know is not zero because f of a is different from f of b. All right. And actually, this is, this is the end of the proof. So that means um, this is a contradiction, right, with, with this. We've assumed that f prime of x is 0 for all x. And we just showed if there are ever two points which are different from, another, from one another, then that means that there is some, uh, some specific point where the derivative is not 0. I didn't mean to write so there. This is a contradiction with f prime x equals 0 for all x, right? So this means um, the constant function is the only function whose derivative is always 0. It's a true fact. All right. Uh, one last thing about this, and then we'll, we'll move on. We'll talk about some uh, sequences of functions. We'll get started on that. Um, so this is my, my second cute corollary. This one is actually pretty important, but it's really the same as what I said earlier. Um, if f and g are differentiable. And f prime equals g prime. If you have two functions that have the same derivative, then what does that mean about uh, f and g? If I have two functions with uh, the same derivatives, can uh, the the Simple answer would be this, although that's not exactly right. Is that not quite true? What, what should it say? 
plus a constant. Yeah, this is something that everybody knows about when you start to learn about the antiderivative. If two functions have the same derivative, then they uh, maybe are not equal to one another, but they are different by a constant. So I'll say f of x equals g of x plus k for some constant. All right. <coughs> If two functions are differentiable, then they are, and they have the same derivative, then they are different from one another by a constant. This is basically why when you do the antiderivative, you get a plus c, but you don't get a plus anything else. Like the, the, the difference between two functions who have the same derivative is just a constant. It's not anything else. Um, why is this true? This is very, very simple. It follows from this thing here. If a, if a derivative is always zero, then that function must be a constant function. That's what I'm going to use here. So you can do it. This is a cute little trick here. I'm going to let h of x be f of x minus g of x. And then think about what is the derivative of h. Then h prime is, well, the derivative would be f prime of x minus g prime of x because that's how you subtract with the derivative. Uh, what can you do with that? Based on what we're, what we're talking about here, yeah? It is, it is zero because f prime equals g prime. So this is zero. So that means h prime of x is always zero. And because of the one we just did here, a function whose derivative is always zero is a constant. So that means h of x is a constant. I'll write as a big old k. All right. And then, anybody see how you can make this happen? This is what we're trying to show. f of x equals g of x plus k. Um, yeah? Yeah, right. If you just kind of plug, like this h is f minus g, but I just said h is a constant, and so if you sort of plug that back up there. It means k equals f of x minus g of x. So add the g of x. f of x equals g of x plus k, which is what we wanted to show. Right? Isn't that what we said? Yeah. So the moral of the story is two functions with the same derivative are different by a constant, which is really, that is a a basic fact that the whole idea of the antiderivative is, is based on that. This is where the, the, why you get the plus c, and it's just a constant. It's not some other weird thing. All right. And I believe this will conclude our little um, discussion of the greatest hits from calculus. Anybody feel like we've uh, skipped anything? I don't mean to skip over your favorite greatest hit from calculus. I mean, we didn't talk about the integral at all, but I don't want to get into that. But um, you certainly, you can talk about the integral. The integral as like a limit of Riemann sums or whatever is more complicated than the derivative uh, as a limit, which is why. For our remaining uh, week and a half of class, I would rather talk about sequences of functions than get into the integral, because I think it's a little more interesting. Any last thoughts about calculus before we put it behind us? All right. Um, so what I would like to talk about the next few times is some basic functional analysis starting with sequences of functions. And my goal for the next 10 minutes is just to convince you that sequences of functions uh, can actually be fairly crazy. and. Um, a lot weirder than just like sequences of real numbers. Even if you're using very ordinary functions. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about crazy functions, but just making sequences of functions and then seeing kind of what does it converge to. So uh, the big idea here is if fn is a sequence of functions, Sort of, can we discuss 
uh, something like, you know, fn converges to f. If you have a bunch of functions in a sequence, is there such a thing as those functions approach some other function? That's what I want to talk about. Um, the, this I wrote as a question. The, the answer is yes, we can discuss this. This is what we're going to discuss. But sort of what does that mean and what kinds of things will be true of this kind of convergence? For example, you can ask questions like, if each of the fn's are continuous and they converge to something, do they converge to something which is continuous? Um, or something like that. If each of the fn's are bounded, then do, does the function they converge to, is it also bounded? That kind of a thing is what I want to talk about. Actually, the answer to both of those questions that I just asked is no. But uh, anyway, let's just look at some very simple examples. Fun examples. Nothing, uh, nothing complicated today. Although you'll see these get fairly interesting, even for very simple things. How about this? Fn of x is x squared over n. All right? This is a sequence of functions. You know, if I were to write out the terms of this sequence, it would be x squared is the first one, and then x squared over 2, x squared over 3. Right? This is a sequence. They're always x squared and just increasing the denominator, etc. Does that converge to anything? As a function, I mean. No, not as numbers. If I were to draw the graphs, let's try and draw the graphs. Uh, the first one, x squared. Everybody knows x squared looks like that, right? A little lopsided. This is x squared. What about the next one? What does x squared over 2 look like? How would you describe it in relationship to that one? It's kind of similar. Let's see some, some of this. Skinnier, your, op your options are skinnier like towards the y-axis, or is it more laid out? I think it's actually, let's see someone doing this, praising them. Um, I think it's actually further out like this. When you divide by 2, that x, o, x squared over 2 means you, you cut all these y values in half. So where this used to be up here, when you go over 2, it's, it's down further. So x squared over 2 is more like this. x squared over 3 is yet again a little bit flatter out, right? That's what these things look like. And so on. x squared over 4, like so, all right? So would you, would you mind if I say it looks like, do those functions converge to anything? If you imagine sort of in the limit of the red lines, do the red lines actually have a limit? What would you say? Yeah, yeah, it looks like they kind of converge to a constant function just along the x-axis, all right? So it looks like these functions, f of n, they approach the constant function, f of x equals 0, all right? That's what it seems to me. And I, I mean, this is actually true, what I wrote there with the arrow there. It, it is true. The f of n's converge to 0. It's true. Something weird, uh, immediately weird about this that I would like you to notice, note fn as functions are unbounded for each n. Every, uh, every one of the individual functions in this sequence is a parabola that goes up forever, right? But what they converge to is, is the constant function 0, which is bounded, like extremely bounded, right? So this is, this is a little weird that fn are unbounded for each n, but converge to 0, which of course is bounded. That's a little weird, but uh, weird but true. These functions individually are unbounded, but the thing they converge to is, uh, is a bounded function. All right, uh, we got five more minutes. Here's another one. How about fn of x equals, how about x squared times n now? Or I'll write n x squared. Rather than dividing by n, I 
going to multiply. So this time, the first one is the ordinary parabola. That's x squared. Um, this one, the next one will be 2x squared. These ones will actually get steeper every time and sort of closer to the y-axis every time, right? So 2x squared will be like this. 3x squared is even steeper still, etc. And the, they sort of converge kind of that way. All right. What would you say about this sequence of functions? Does this sequence of functions converge to another function? Yeah? What do you think? No. <laughs> um, I would say it doesn't look to me like these converge to a function because the y values, I mean this, uh, they, they get, it's, it's getting tighter and tighter around the y-axis. Um, I don't think that makes a function. If, if anything, you could say, like, what does the red lines converge to? The red lines converge to a vertical line on the y-axis, but that doesn't make any sense. That's not a function, right? So this example, fn of x here, this does not converge to a function. Right? Although, something a little weird about this one is, I will just say, although um, f, this is a true fact, fn of zero is always zero, right? So the point, specifically the point zero, is always right there for every one of these. And so if you're talking about what does it converge to, well, it kind of does converge to something just right here, but for all the other points, it doesn't converge to anything. Uh, this is a little, a little strange. Can I give you one more in our remaining three minutes? Just to go full circle here. What about um, fn of x equals e to the nx? And I'm just going to draw the pictures for this one. Uh, e to the nx. So we begin with e to the x is the first one, which looks like this. The next one is e to the 2x. What does that look like? Anybody recall? Would you say it's like that, but I mean, your, your choices, I suppose, are is steeper or less steep? Or flipped over upside down? It's not flipped over upside down. It's steeper, yeah, e to the 2x. This is like, you know, you're raising e to some power. If you make that n into a 2, it's, it's an even bigger power than whatever that was. So e to the 2x, this is, a little, this is a little strange though. When you plug in 0, even for e to the 2x, you still get 1. e to the 2 times 0 is, is still 1, right? So actually, it still goes through 1 here, but it's steeper after that. And if you, you might want to, if you really care, plug this into your calculator, you'll see actually on the left side, it's smaller. So e to the 2x, it goes, it's bigger on the right side, but it's smaller on the left side. When you plug in negative exponents, it's um, smaller. All right, that's e to the 2x. e to the 3x looks like this. e to the 4x looks like this, etc. Right. What does this converge to? What's interesting about this is, when I look at this, I say, on the right side, it doesn't look like it converges to anything. Because again, I have sort of curves which are becoming vertical. And the vertical, I mean, it is something, but it's not a function. So over here, it is not converging to any function. But over here, actually, it is converging to 0. These lines are getting uh, closer and closer to the constant function zero. But right here, it stays one all the time. All right, so my very weird conclusion here is, looks like this, I'm gonna say, seems to converge to something like 
0 if x is less than 0, 1 if x equals 0, and just nothing if x is more than 0. Right? Very strange. Uh, this, if you like, is not really a function over here. But over here, it is a function, but it's not even continuous. It has this like jump, uh, even though all of the original functions that I used were continuous. Very weird. We'll, uh, we'll do some, some actual uh, business with this next time. See you then. We got homework for today. Check it out.